Hi guys, I'm Tom Butler Bowden and welcome to the very first episode of Book Insights. So why have we started this podcast? Well, in the last 10 years there's been a boom in intelligent non-fiction books. It seems like the world going a little bit crazy. People actually need and want ways to really go deeper. And to my mind, a great non-fiction book can do that. So in Book Insights, What we're going to do each week is uh, a deep dive into a non-fiction bestseller. It might be self-help or psychology or business or philosophy. Um, It might be a recent hit or an ancient classic. The main thing is that the books that we're choosing are potentially high impact title for you. The script for each of the book insights have been written by experts in their field. Then we've recorded them with professional voice actors. What we're aiming to do is get you concentrated wisdom that makes you think and helps you succeed in relationships, career, or business. Book Insights also grew out of my 50 Classics book series. That is a 15-year project in which I read hundreds of books in self-development, philosophy, social sciences, and then published my notes in book form. It was an amazing experience as a writer, but I'm very keen to reach a lot more people with the power of these ideas. I'm also editor of the Capstone Classics series of great non-fiction books and VP of content for Memoed, which is a sort of knowledge shortcuts app that will be launching very soon. Onto the book we're looking at today and the nature of being wrong. We might be prepared to admit fault over small things, but what about admitting we've been wrong about something like our faith? or our career, or even our choice of spouse. Pretty hard to do, right? These things are so important for our happiness and self-worth, so it makes sense to eliminate error as much as possible. In her book, Being Wrong, Adventures in the Margin of Error, Catherine Schultz shows the benefits and transformative potential of actually embracing our wrongness. It's pretty good, and I recommend it alongside another classic work on mental biases, which you've probably heard of, Thinking Fast and Slow, by Daniel Kahneman. And that's another one that we're going to cover in Book Insights. But why did we choose being wrong for this very first episode? Well, for a good reason. I'm sure you've noticed we're having a global health crisis, and it seems obvious that the cost of being wrong can be massive, even a matter of life and death. So let's begin. If you like the podcast, please give us a rating or a review and uh, make sure you tune in next week when we'll be looking at Steven Pinker's brilliant book, Enlightenment Now. But first, let's have a look at being wrong. Twelve hundred years before Descartes said, I think, therefore I am, St. Augustine wrote, Fowler ergo sum, I err, therefore I am. To be human is to be wrong, and wrongness is a sort of proof that we're alive. It's not far from Descartes' proof of existence. And if that is so, author Catherine Schultz says, surely it's time we got to know it. Mistakes may seem like a strange subject to write a book about, but Being Wrong, subtitled Adventures in the Margins of Error, brilliantly shows why they matter. They can destroy our self-confidence alienate us from others, land us in prison, or kill us. A mistake made by a whole discipline, culture, or religion can have much worse effects. Belief in the science of phrenology, for instance, led to awful discrimination against people and groups who didn't have the right shape of head. Catherine Schultz's larger question is, what does it do to our sense of self when something we believe deeply turns out to be wrong? Being Wrong was published a year before Daniel Kahneman's blockbuster, Thinking Fast and Slow, which detailed his Nobel-winning research into human biases and thinking errors. Schultz's book is distinct, in that it is more of a philosophical take on wrongness. This book insight focuses on three key points from Being Wrong, human wrongness, why and how we're wrong, and the benefits of self-deception. We'll end by seeing the book within the larger context of wrongness as understood by philosophers such as Plato and Spinoza. In her TED Talk, entitled On Being Wrong, 
Schultz makes this overarching point. Realizing you're wrong can feel like all of that and a lot of other things, right? I mean, it can be devastating. It can be revelatory. But just being wrong doesn't feel like anything. Though mistakes are very much a part of the fabric of who we are, it's our nature to downplay, cover over, deny, or to blame them on others. To compensate for this failing, religions have developed proper ways of admitting wrongness, from Catholicism's Sacrament of Confession to Judaism's Yom Kippur. More recently, programs like the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous serve this purpose. And of course, the criminal justice system has elements of penitence along with the punishment. But in society generally, what mechanism is there for admitting you're wrong halfway through an argument? Or bigger, non-criminal things like halfway through life, admitting that you've been wrong about your faith, your career, or your choice of spouse? We find it easier to admit error on small things, but are unwilling to admit wrongness on the big matters. Here's Schultz again in her TED Talk comparing being wrong with Roadrunner and Coyote cartoons. When we're wrong about something, not when we realize it, but before that, we're like that coyote after he's gone off the cliff and before he looks down. Yet surely, if the big things are so important to our happiness and sense of worth, shouldn't we do absolutely everything we can to eliminate error in making such decisions? The difficulty in admitting we're wrong is matched by the ease with which we can see error in others. Captured by that delicious phrase, I told you so. It feels good to be right. In relationships, Schultz recalls the therapist's adage that you can either be right or be in a relationship. In politics, she notes that of all the strife in the world, a staggering amount of it arises from the clash of mutually incompatible, entirely unshakable feelings of rightness. Just think of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, which has dragged on for decades, or at the increasing polarization of American politics between hard right and hard left camps. Apart from this rightness of belief, there are endless policy and strategic decisions based on wrong information. For a prime example, just think back to Saddam Hussein's fabled weapons of mass destruction that triggered the Second Iraq War. Given our limited intellects, poor memories, raging emotions, and the five senses that give us a very distorted picture of the world, humans are particularly susceptible to getting things wrong. Many domains now have a subfield of error mitigation, which involves paying people to find errors. Though it's not hard to spot mistakes in a manufacturing process, identifying the sources and range of human error is more complex, because humans have so many potential ways of messing up. You know, we're already wrong. We're already in trouble but we feel like we're on solid ground. So I should actually correct something I said a moment ago. It does feel like something to be wrong. It feels like being right. That's Schultz again in her TED Talk. On that, we'll wrap up for now. We've gone over the first key point from being wrong by Katherine Schultz. As humans, the most practical state we can exist in is wrongness. We were made to be wrong most of the time, so we must anticipate being wrong. Next time, we'll conclude our discussion. We'll look at why and how we make mistakes. Then, we'll conclude with how we can still succeed through being wrong. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodeapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're continuing our discussion on Katherine Schultz's exploration into being wrong. It's called Being Wrong, Adventures in the Margins of Error. Previously, we've covered the first key point of human error. To err is to be human. We're made for mistakes. Now, we'll cover the final two key points. We'll explore the why and how of errors. Then, we'll discuss the benefits of self-deception. Finally, we'll look at the legacy of wrongness. The surprise isn't that we're often wrong. 
The salient point about error is that we never know where and how we'll be wrong. When you're in the middle of an error, you're totally unaware of it. It always seems we're on the right path. This error blindness means that the saying, I am wrong, in the present tense, is a logical impossibility. We can only say we were wrong. Schultz calls this the Heisenberg uncertainty principle of error. We can be wrong, or we can know it, but we can't do both at the same time. Error blindness accounts for how we're always surprised or shocked by our own stupidity. It can be summed up in the desperate and bewildered phrase, what was I thinking? Part of the reason for error blindness is that we have a database design flaw in our brains. We're not good at remembering or categorizing times when we've been wrong. We lay ourselves open to commit the same errors and are surprised when we do. Schultz describes the phenomenon of superior or arctic mirages caused by the curvature of the Earth. These mirages commonly occur near the poles. They show sailors the illusion of large landmasses on the horizon. If sailors relied on sight alone, they'd make grave errors. It's only by trusting their navigational tools that they can dismiss the supposed visual evidence. The point is that our senses are quite unreliable as a source of truth, and yet it seems natural for us to trust them. This is one reason why we're always surprised when we are wrong. The history of science amounts to a history of errors. Each generation corrects these errors, only to be corrected in the next. Certain theories say that every theory will eventually be proven wrong. If this is so, why assume that anything we believe today is correct? All our knowledge comes back to what we believe so we have to look at belief itself. A psychological study placed a table in a department store displaying four pairs of pantyhose. They asked shoppers to give an opinion on the pantyhose. Each shopper then went ahead choosing which one they thought was best, giving reasons for their choice. Some people went into elaborate detail. However, all four pairs were identical. We're not only easily fooled, we love to give reasons for our foolish choices. In the absence of knowledge, we make things up. As much as we love knowledge, we are not so good at ensuring what we know is right, or even worse at recognizing when we don't know something. Finally, we're brilliant at making things up and fictionalizing stories to suit our interests. Alan Greenspan was chairman of the U.S. Federal Reserve. His absolutist belief in free markets was confounded with the global economic meltdown of 2008. Greenspan was open enough to admit that his model of the financial world, which had seemed a good description of reality for decades, had been wrong. Here's Greenspan reflecting on that wrongness while talking with Bloomberg. And uh, I anticipated that it was going to happen. I just didn't know exactly when. But nobody forecast the 2008 crisis. We think our model of the world is the world itself. And this leads us to make three assumptions. First, the ignorance assumption. Since we are convinced that our belief is based on fact, we think that people who disagree do so because they don't have the necessary information. If they knew what we knew, they would think like us. Second, the idiocy assumption. Those who disagree with us know the facts but don't have the brains to understand them. And third, the evil assumption. Other people have the facts and are able to understand them but have deliberately decided to ignore them. Like toddlers and tyrants, we're quick to take our own stories for the infallible truth, and we dismiss anyone who disagrees as wrong-headed or wicked. Is there anything we can do to lessen the frequency by which we're wrong? To build strong foundations for our beliefs, we must continually seek out evidence that challenges those beliefs, and we must take the evidence seriously. To avoid big and costly errors, we must go against our natural assumption that we're right and sometimes assume that we're wrong. Schultz notes the countless studies showing that people who suffer from depression have a more accurate picture of reality than the non-depressed. Bill Gates even said in the days when he ran Microsoft that he needed more pessimists around. They were the only ones who could state the truth. But generally, this is the kind of accuracy we don't want, 
because it erodes optimism and well-being. Psychologist William James had the pragmatic notion that it doesn't matter what you believe so long as it has a positive effect on you. Think of children. They know little, but they're usually much happier than grown-ups. Schultz mentions studies suggesting that most of us see ourselves as slightly better looking than we are. We also believe that our homes are grander than the reality would suggest, and we see our loved ones in an overly rosy light. These beliefs might skew the truth, but they stave off depression, give meaning to our lives, and makes us and those we love happy, says Schultz. Moreover, we wouldn't attempt half the things we do if we have a more accurate picture of what we can achieve in a certain time frame. One of the book's uplifting conclusions is that wrongness can make us optimistic. If we know we've been wrong, then we can feel we must be gloriously right in the future. A better world can be made from what we've learned. Seen this way, error is not a deflection of the human condition, but part of its glory. Plato believed our souls were once part of universal truth, but when we took on physical form, we forgot these eternal truths. In the modern era, Heidegger said that because we're beings that exist in time and space, we're obstructed from seeing the true reality, which is not limited by these dimensions. Despite mentioning such ideas in passing, Schultz doesn't go further with these interesting possibilities. We're fallible because we're a body with five senses, and rely on these too much to interpret our world. But the point of every religion and the argument of many philosophers is that we arrive at truth only by putting our physicality in context, by reducing sensory input. St. Augustine came to the view that self-knowledge by the self was impossible. It was only in the context of a larger metaphysical reality that we could get some understanding of the reason for our existence. We're concluding our look at Being Wrong by Katherine Schultz. We looked at three key points, the wrongness of being human, how and why we err, and finally, the benefits of self-deception. We get things wrong when we see ourselves as an island of consciousness, existing for ourselves and seeing things only from our perspective. Isn't it true that many of the right decisions in our lives come from putting others first or seeing ourselves as just one among many? Though Schultz doesn't say it herself, this is one implication we can draw from her work. It's hard to go wrong when we loosen the ego's grip, with all its potential for error. For the individual who doesn't loosen their ego and puts their individual mindset above others, it's a long way to the bottom of the canyon. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice. Thank you.